Man, you done played at, at the highest levels of every level of basketball. You know, I think you led the ACC in scoring, uh, played the highest levels of Europe, played in the NBA. So that being said, obviously you done seen a lot of different styles of basketball over the year, which I over the years, which I think is a uh, is really dope. I don't think a lot of people get to see that. Um, so uh, having that acumen, you know, there's four guys, four international players at the top of the MVP race. Who best fits in the NBA? And who best fits the FIBA style? Uh, I mean, it would have to be it would have to be Luca. I mean, I think um, we seen Luke like Luca was dominant. It's just like his swagger about him it was different than most Europeans. Welcome back to the Role Player Podcast. We back for another episode, episode three revamp with Swiss Cultures. We got my man Anthony Good, CEO of Swiss Cultures, eleven year pro. With us again on the host, Ant, was good? Appreciate you coming back again. Hey, man, I'm, uh, I'm getting real comfortable over here, man. I'm getting real comfortable, man. We got a, we got, we, we got, we got Mr. Delaney here, man. I, I ain't wanna, I ain't wanna gas him, man, but <laughs> it's gonna be a funny episode, man. I, I can feel it. Hey. I feel it. He, hey. he don't hold, he don't hold nothing back. <laughs> Wait, only way to be. No, hold nothing back, man. We and like, like he said, facts, facts. So as uh, as Ant said, I forgot to shout out Stanford too. I got to shout out University of Stanford every time. So you know, just so just so the people know, and just so y'all know, we got a very special guest this time. Very special guest, uh, NBA vet, Euro League vet, two time Italian Cup winner, Italian Cup MVP. I can't go through it all because we're gonna be here all day, all Euro League first team. Uh, if I forget anything, you want to shout it out, just let me know. But we got the one and only DMV's finest, Malcolm Delaney. What's up, man? Appreciate you joining us. Appreciate y'all having me, man. Pretty glad to be here. No doubt, no doubt. So we're going to jump right into it, man. We, uh, Malcolm is playing in Milan right now. Um, what's this year? Fifth, fifth year league? Sixth year league season? League season. Uh, I think, yeah, fifth. Fifth year league season, so... Munich, Barca. League Barca. season, so yeah, yeah. Barca. Fifth Euro League season, you done play for some of the some of the most storied clubs in Euro League in Europe. So we're gonna start with playing for Milan, and y'all are in the in have a home court advantage, right, for the playoff right now. Y'all are the third or fourth seed, and uh, just talk about what it's like playing for that many storied franchises, specifically Milan, and playing for a coach like a Tori Messina. Uh, I mean, for me, it was a. Uh... It, it was kind of like a dream come true. You know, you, you wait for the day you play for a good coach that you can kind of relate to uh, in Europe. You know, there's a lot of historically good coaches, but you can't communicate with them. Uh, just dealing with different things on and off the court. But, you know, Coach Messina, the first time I talked to him, uh, he just, it was it was just a comfort level with him um, to be able to talk to him, uh, to relate with what, you know, he had in mind for basketball on and off the court. So, uh, like I told a lot of people before, the first conversation I had with him, I wanted to play for him. And that's rare to have with, you know, European coaches where, you know what I'm saying, like not just basketball, like off the court, you know, dealing with your private time. Uh, a lot of coaches don't respect players' private time, and that was one of the biggest things, you know, that attracted me to to coach. Man, y'all playing, uh, y'all playing a, lot of, a lot of guards, man. And for those that don't know, real quick, Tori Messina, he played, coached a long time with San Antonio Spurs, really a – NBA icon and a Euro League icon at this point for those that don't know. But y'all playing a lot of guards right now between Sergio Rodriguez, yourself, Troy Daniels. Um, y'all kind of bring a little bit of an NBA style to Europe. Uh, so kind of talk about that, uh, what that means to you, how fun that's been, uh, just the overall experience. Uh, so like the with the project that he wanted to start, um, that was another thing we had in the first conversation. He wanted to uh, – you know, Coach Messina was known as one of the tougher coaches when he was – I met him first when he was in Seska. I played against him in Munich. And uh, just, I guess, his time in San Antonio kind of changed his perspective of, you know, how he wanted to approach the game. And uh, with low management stuff, as simple as that, that you don't hear about in Europe, um, you know, making sure the players are, are as healthy as possible um, and giving us breaks, playing in between two different competitions. Uh I mean, playing with all these guards is it's tough sometimes, but, you know, I think we all had the common goal of trying to win. So nobody here really cares about who scores, who has the most assists. Um, and that's one of the most important things. I think a lot of people look at 
our stat sheet sometimes and I might take three shots or, you know, Chacho might take three shots and they know that we can score. So everybody, they, you know, it's kind of confusing sometimes looking at our team, but if you really look at our team, nobody cares. All the averages are pretty much around the same. We all play the same minutes. Uh, and I think, you know, that's the best thing about our team. Sometimes it hurts us because, you know, maybe we do need uh, somebody else to get 25 or 30. But I think for the most part in the long run, it, it's one of the things beneficial to us because we got a lot of guys who can step up on any night and nobody cares about who, you know, the, the main guy is on, on, on any given night. In regards to his system, in regards to his system, how do you, how do you think, Messina's system now compares to like other European coaches that you've had. Um, does it resemble like, let's say, like your time with the Hawks, or is it is it kind of like a hybrid, like a mix of both? Yeah, my, my I just literally I just said this yesterday. I, I text my agent and I said this feels like you know when I play with the Hawks. Like I literally uh, texted him this last night um, because if you look at most European systems, of course it's a team game, but most systems are based around one player or two players, like. You know, if you look at, I mean, we played Monaco last night. Their system is based around Mike. So, you know, they have a lot of guys who can do different things, but everything comes back to Mike. You go to Ephesus and you got Misic and Larkin. Everything goes through them. You know what I'm saying? So when you go to Barcelona, you know you got to go through Miritich. With our team, we don't have, uh, you know, Siobhan is probably the, the leading scorer, but a uh, team can't scout us and say, okay, if we take one player away, it destroys everything because we don't have a system based around one player is it could be something different every night. And, um, I think that's the, another quality we have. And sometimes is, you know, something that hurts us a little bit too. But, um, I think for the most part, him developing that type of system where you bring in a lot of guys who sacrifice every night. Um, and at any given moment that anybody could take over, I think it's harder for teams to scout us. You know, it seems pretty easy because nobody's scoring a lot of points. But, uh, you know, Chacho could get hot. I could get hot. Uh, Siobhan could get hot at any moment. So you can't really defend uh, one person. And I think in the playoffs, you know, in a regular season, you can kind of see it. But I think in the playoffs, once the game slows down and, you know, we really lock in on the game plan, that stuff is, is what helps us, you know, get to a Final Four. Man, talk about talk about how you've evolved as a player because obviously, you know, especially when you was younger, you were a guy in college as well who could score, you know, 25 a night, right? So how have you evolved in terms of wanting to be that guy or balancing wanting to be that guy and kind of being able to te take a step back and play with players who can get it done as well? Um, for me, I mean, it was it, it's easy for me because uh, one thing my agent always told co uh, coaches, and it was my biggest selling point, I can adapt to any situation. Like any role you give me, I'll take. I'm not – like now I know I can still get – 20 every night if you know what I'm saying if I was in that type of role but I didn't come here for that like I did when I signed in Milan it wasn't you know not saying like I, I don't think I could be an MVP but my ambition wasn't to be EuroLeague MVP because if I played that way we wouldn't be as good of course I need to play better for us to be on a high level but me playing like I played in Loco isn't the same as what we need here in Milan so you know I had to kind of scale back you know my personal um, my personal goals and because I want to win a Euro League. And once I came back to Europe with Barcelona and Milan, it wasn't about, you know, trying to make sure that everybody sees that I'm the best point guard out there. Of course, when I get on the court, I'm going to defend the best player on the other team. You know, I'm going to attack whoever, but I want to make sure that I sacrifice whatever I have to do for us to win. So, uh, you know, some sometimes it is tough. You know, I don't like personally, I haven't like check stats in the last two years because it, that it doesn't matter to me. But, you know, you know, if I talk to my parents and they ask me, like, why weren't you aggressive or, you know, they don't understand the ins and outs of everything. And that sometimes frustrates me. But I look at the bigger picture and the bigger picture is, you know, I came here for a reason. And it's not, you know, to come here and get 25 a night because that would interrupt our whole uh, style of play. Uh, so it, it's difficult sometimes, but I think for the most part, with me being older, um, you know, that time will come. You know, if I, when I'm done in Europe, if I want to go take 20 shots a game, I can go do that somewhere else. But for right now, it's all about, you know, trying to do what, whatever I can do um, to help us win the EuroLeague. Man, that being said, too, do you see y'all style of play, the balanced style of play, maybe multiple guards, somewhat small ball? you see that being the future of EuroLeague as well? You see somebody just similar to the NBA, I guess? 
Yeah, um, a lot of teams are starting to do it. I mean, if you, you look at, like, Ephes, they'll play Mises, Larkin, and Boboa together. You know what I'm saying? Like, they'll play – like, a lot of teams don't play with a, a conventional three-man now. And uh, you know how Europe is. And, you know, most people who played the two back home can play the three in Europe. Some three-man can play stretch four. So I think it's turning more to that, especially with the shooting. Um, there's a lot less uh, dominant big guys in EuroLeague now. Uh, so it's it kind of getting based to based around the guards again. And I think it's it's fun for us because you get to play. Not only do I get to play against some of my brothers, you know, we uh, it just makes the game faster. You know, a lot of teams don't just slow the ball, play half court like they used to, um, you know, with the typical European style point guards. But now everybody's in attack mode and you might have a Barcelona, but you might have a Monaco where they got yesterday. They played us with four guards and they just, you know, pick and roll with, with one and two. And they had two shooting guards on the court with Mike. So it's like, you know what I'm saying? You got to play against different styles like that. And, you know, it could, the games could get messy and teams like that could be dangerous just because of guard play. Yo, I was, I was just about to say too, I've noticed like, Especially like in the last few years, the amount of guard to guard screens, like on balls, you know what I mean? It, it's been crazy. So when you was playing over here, that never, like I never right. did that until the last two or three years. And it's like, that's an NBA, that's something people take from the NBA. Like, it was kind of like if you try to pick out a matchup and just go, you know, one, three pick and roll, one, two, a, a coach would get mad about that before. It, mm-hmm. It's not conventional okay. European style of play, but now. You know, we, you know, like I said, once the game slows down and you'll see it more in the playoffs, um, that was one of the things that gave us uh, problems with Munich last year. They did that and we weren't prepared for it. So it was like, you know, if they see a weak link on the court, they'll just go pick and roll until they get a switch or they keep making guards heads. And a lot of guards aren't comfortable playing, you know, pick and roll like that. Uh, And now, like, everybody's starting to do it. It's like most coaches know, like, when the game slows down, you have to attack weak links and it's not always the big man because a lot of you know what i'm saying you don't want to go pick and roll with kyle uh and get a switch with kyle in the last you know 10 seconds of a shot clock you might want to go at a two guard so um yeah it's, start, it's starting to change a lot man like the game is starting to evolve a lot over here and uh a lot of coaches aren't as stubborn to it um as they were before because before it never would have happened how do you see that affecting the popularity of the game you know the style of play that you have with with messina being there now you all play multiple guards uh between you and cha-cha and like even troy daniels um when i first got to europe it was a very slow down style slower pace and you know now you get 20 mike james gets 20 it's going to be all over swiss culture it's going to be a it's going to be a popular thing so just playing for someone like Messina who's coming from the NBA and has a name there, how do you see that uh, helping EuroLeague become more of a sellable product? Uh, I think, you know, and I think Euro, I think people in America would have paid attention to EuroLeague more if they would have had it. You know, if we had social media back when, like, you know, Bo McCaleb and, and Keith Langford was really, like, killing. Like, no, when I came into Europe, you know, those were the guys. Yep. Like, and yep. nobody's seen it. So, like... Nobody really – I didn't yeah. know anything about yeah. EuroLeague. I just knew, you know, Jamal Gore and Dante Draper. Like, I knew what they were doing, but I didn't see it on the daily. So now when people can see, like, Mike highlights on Switch Cultures, and everybody knows Mike is an NBA player, but it's like people in the – it's still, you know, European fans, they always, oh, why would Mike go to the NBA and sit on the bench? Or, you know, they always have some type of right. love-hate relationship. Like, if you play for their team, they love you, but – if a player decides to go to the NBA, then they're not good or they're chasing something. So that balance, I think, um, I think it makes it fun actually, because now more people in the States are starting to care. So I think a lot of players that play over here don't really care about the European fans opinion because that was a big thing. Like anything we did, you're typical American or you chasing money or you doing this, but people in America never really seen what we were doing. So they couldn't really, they didn't know. Like a lot of people tell me now, I was shooting my documentary and they was like, yo, like between 2011 and 2016, like we knew you was killing, but we didn't see it. Like we couldn't really, we couldn't see it. And it wasn't no highlight. It wasn't none of that. So, uh, you know, the European opinion is what kind of mattered. Like we went home and they knew we won championships, but they didn't see what we were doing daily. So all we heard was European fans every day, every day. And I used to be on Twitter, like, arguing back and forth with European fans every day. But nobody in America could understand. They would just be like, yo, those fans are crazy. But so I think now, like, if you post one of us on Switch Coaches, 
I mean, it, of course, it'll be some European fans, but I think it's more so like the people that we're more comfortable with, that we actually care about their opinions, they get a chance to see us now. So it's, I think it's, it's helping your league out a lot because now a lot of players want to come over here and play because they see the intensity, you know, they see how much pressure it is. And then if you can come over here and kill, and they, they respect it a lot more now. Yeah, I think, I think too, man, it, uh, you know, you brought up a good point in that so many players were coming over before and we never saw it. Like we didn't, we didn't like, I remember when Josh Childress first left, that was like huge because he was like six man of the year, you know what I mean? That type of thing. And then he left and everybody's like, why are you leaving the NBA to go play over there? And it's like, Josh had a, he had a great career in Europe, but there was no social media. You didn't really see it. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, and I think that him, Using that popularity of that decision, if there was social media there, I think that would have gave EuroLeague and just European basketball more attention because you had a player that was extremely hot in the NBA choosing to go over to Europe. And if it would have been better covered and well documented, you know, I think it would have added to the popularity back then. Absolutely. And that, that's like we heard, like when we heard that happen, I think. For Americans, all we heard about was like the money. It was like, oh, he signed for, you know, a crazy amount of money. But I didn't know about Olympiacos then. So, like, if they just showed like some of those games with the fans, and uh, I think people in America would have been like, damn, like, you know what I'm saying? We right, didn't know. Right. We just knew, like, okay, they got some money over there. That's like, for me, I didn't think about Europe. But once I started, like, I, when Jamal signed with like Galatasaray, right, he was, I told him the other day, I was like, bro, like, you motivated me. He posted a picture on Facebook one day. He was laying in a bed full of money. And I was like, damn, like, they ain't Europe getting money like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, for me, it was just about, you know what I'm saying? That lifestyle was different. It was like NBA. We wanted to, you know, I want to get my people's a crib. I want to drive nice cars. But it's like, I ain't know people in Europe was making 150000 a month and they paying them cash. And, he, and I'm like, yeah, like, it changed my whole perspective. So when we start hearing about some of that stuff, we could only hear about it. We never really seen it unless you knew them people personally. But now I think people starting to see it, like with the stuff that y'all doing, you know what I'm saying? Like getting, uh, you know, overseas fits, they starting to do stuff, getting people out there. Uh, a lot of kids now, they look up and they, you know, we motivation to people, like not just NBA players, like they see us now and as motivation. So uh, it's definitely expanding the brand. Man, I remember at one point they were talking everybody was going to leave Europe. They said LeBron was going over there for $50 million. They said, you know, everybody and their mama was about to leave uh, the NBA and go to Europe. Yeah, ain't never going to happen in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> you might get a couple other guys. Lamelo and IT playing EuroLeague. Ain't going to happen. EuroLeague just uh, extended its partnership with IMG. Um, it's the streaming partnership that they've had for, for a minute. Um, which is dope. Uh, how do you see something like that uh, continue to grow the popularity of the game? You know, you have media out, social media outlets like Swish and, you know, overseas fits, like you said, that are helping grow the popularity of the game. Um, but, you know, like you said, a lot of people are not, a lot of people don't know what's going on over here still. And, you know, when I got first got overseas 2012, you know, Bo McCaleb was doing his thing in Fender. We played them. I had no idea who Fender, Fender was. I knew Bo McCaleb was, but I didn't even know he was killing like that. So, you know, I thought we was, I was in Italy. I thought we was going to play them three, four times, whatever, during the season. I didn't know much about EuroLeague. So who's a, who's an ideal uh, partnership along with IMG uh, stateside? Is it ESPN or? Yeah, I, I think uh, like an ESPN, they, they should. I mean, even like an NBA TV or something like that. I mean, with the amount of uh, American players, you know, doing so well in EuroLeague, I think it's a big platform. Also, um I think with the, especially the yearly playoffs, like the, the atmosphere is so crazy. I think, I mean, it would definitely benefit both parties, not just, you know, the yearly style, but, you know, streaming in America. I think uh, it's dope. It's kind of similar to like a March Madness style crowd, um, but, you know, more intense. So I think, you know, ESPN should look at it or look, in, look into it a little bit more. I know NBA TV used to do it like a game of the week every week, uh, but, I think they need to do it to a bigger capacity. And uh, for us, uh, like I said, I, I don't think our you know family should have to search for a link or you know go to EuroLeague TV to try to watch a game. Uh, they should be able to just turn on the channel and, 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 and watch these games. So uh, I think that's the next step. I think, I mean, moving forward, you looking back from 10 years, 
uh, 10 years ago, people was on sling boxes and, you know, doing all this different stuff. We didn't have these, even these apps to even look at the game. So I think it'll move towards that direction. Somebody will eventually, you know, pick it up, especially with the, the NBA and Europe You're trying to work together a little bit more. Um, some will happen. Bro, like, I don't know if y'all paid attention, but if y'all see some of these games they got on ESPN3 and ESPN+, Plus, it'd be like Tijuana Tech versus I don't know who else. Like, bro, you could throw up an Olympiacos game with somebody. Like, you know what I mean? ESPN bugging. Like, all them games they be covering, ain't, ain't nobody watching them games. Yeah, y'all could throw a couple Euro book. games on there. It would be straight. Nah, they lose me when they start putting, you know, cornhole on there and all <laughs> them other sports you know nobody's watching. It's, it's actually – I want to know what goes into them putting which sports on. Like, obviously, I understand the basics of it. But, you know, there's no reason that you can't have a, an Olympiacos game on there. Obviously, you know, the WNBA, that's their whole argument. But Olympiacos or even a Milan game on there on ESPN, I think it would draw a lot of interest. No, it's awful. It's awful. I don't I don't even watch it no more. I don't watch ESPN no more. I used to, like, that was something, like, I woke up every day. It's like, all right, let me check ESPN. Let me check. Like, I don't even, I don't even watch it. Like, it, it just, the sport, the debate shows is like, it, I don't even be wanting to watch it. So I, I'll check highlights every now and then, and that's it. Like, I don't even watch the show no more. Right. And then now you got you got social media, so you really don't need ESPN. Yeah, you don't need it. Everything you need is right there on social media. <laughs> it's like you don't even need the channel. But yeah, it, it it'll benefit both parties, I think, if they they start streaming more games. With the business of basketball growing so much, and so many basketball players getting into business and showing their their business acumen, man, shout out your um, we want we want you to shout out your business, um, the sports bar you got coming out. Um, just let people know what that's all about. Yeah, uh, so I, uh, yeah, it'll be the grand opening. It'll be July. Um, so I'm opening up a, a sports bar in Baltimore called uh, So Baltimore. Basically, um, <clears throat> a Baltimore-oriented sports bar. Um, you know, me paying homage to all the guys who paved the way for me. You know, on the basketball end. So I got like, you know, all the guys that I looked up to. I did a, a mural on the wall. Uh, pretty much, you know, th those are the guys I follow behind. And then, you know, just the, the menu will be like a Baltimore style, um, a creative Baltimore style menu. Uh, but I, I just wanted to do something different. You know, a lot of people did, they do lounges, they do clubs, um, but, you know, I'm a hooper. So, you know, I want people to have a, a comfortable place to come in and watch games and, you know, eat some good food and just chill, especially in our city. We Everybody does the same thing. So I just wanted to do something you know, uh, for me, that was more authentic. Um, I, I didn't just want to go typical lounge or club. And uh, it's coming together now. So, you know, I, I have a bigger idea with it. Um, so I'm trying to, you know, focus on this first venue, uh, you know, put everything into that. So once I, you know, start getting these ideas out there, that'll just flow freely. Uh, but, yeah, that's that's uh, that'll be my project. So besides, when I'm off the court, man, like when I get off here with y'all, I got to uh, – email all these bartenders back that you know that that made the final list for um the interview so and i'm hands-on with everything like i i do have a team but uh they like I, i'm i'm, I'm hands-on so that's one of the biggest things with me like outside of basketball and why i need more time you know at the crib because i i got a lot of stuff going on but i don't really have time to, to be there so um you know when i'm off the court man like we got a day off today and I'm not going, you know, around the city in Milan. Like I'm, I got business to handle. So, you know, I got a an, another game to look forward to Sunday, but also I got business to take care of off the court. So, uh, that's where most of my time goes. Yo, yo, I just had an idea for you, man. Just going back to uh, our last conversation we just had, you should have like a TV or an area somewhere in your sports bar. And on loop, you just have the overseas games from the Baltimore legends. So, Jamon, yourself, and all the Baltimore guys. And just, you know, obviously go to Synergy and just download the games and then mm -hmm. just have them on loop. You know what I'm saying? So you have, like, one TV dedicated towards, you know, Baltimore talent. And it could be high school games. It could be overseas games, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. I think that would be, like, a, a dope little accent, you know what I'm saying? So, and it will also introduce, you know, the city to, you know, what their players are doing. Yep, makes sense. I'm definitely uh, uh, one thing we definitely talked about was um, you know streaming like the the Euro Cup, Euro League games. Um, you know sometimes the time difference is, is weird, but uh, maybe doing it the next day, uh, stuff like that. Because a lot of people, 
you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of people from Baltimore playing right now. And literally people in our city don't even know, because like I said, like when once people don't see people for a while or they're not living in the city, uh, they just I mean, they know they see pictures and videos, but they don't really get the chance to see the actual game. So that was one of the biggest things like having, you know, once Euro League, Euro Cup, um, just just having those games stream the next day uh, so people can actually watch them um, as, as close to being live as possible. So yeah, that's definitely you know having that set up, uh, just a basic Euro, a European side, <laughs> we might be able to do that. Man, I got a million dollar idea for you right now, man. Just make sure anything you do or get involved with, make sure you hire Anthony Goods as your consultant <laughs> or your CEO, whatever it is. This man got a new idea every episode, and it's always gold. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's super dope. Super dope that you were able to turn, you know, basketball into something beyond basketball. Something especially that can uh, positively impact your community too, with uh, economically specifically. And uh, you know, speaking of which, you know, we see a lot of NBA players doing that. Chris Paul was just named to the board of advisors for HBCUs by Joe Biden, which is dope. Uh, super, super big step, I think, for Hoopers. Just talk about how guys like Chris Paul, like LeBron. Um, all these dudes we see uh, kind of leading the way in that aspect have inspired you to to do that on your end, you know, as a as an NBA vet and as an overseas vet. Nah, for me, uh, it's crazy, man. Like when I grew up, like I always like thinking of ideas. Like you know, what I'm saying, like I I wasn't my family wasn't poor, but you know, we we had to figure it out. You feel me? So like just naturally growing up in my the environment I grew up in, it was always like, you know, I didn't have what I wanted, but. Like, when I do get the money, what I'm going to do with it? Like, I, that's, that always was a thought in my mind. Like, all right, you know what I'm saying? Like, I see my dream car was like a, a BMW 650. It's like, man, like, you know, I can't get it now. But once I get some money, like, I already knew, like, in my mind, like, some of the stuff I had to knock off a checklist. And I always tell people, like, you know, some people got goals. It's like, okay, yeah, my goal was to, to make it to the NBA, but how was I going to get there? It's like, okay, like, my dream car is a Lamborghini. Like, what do I got to do to get to a Lamborghini? Like, you know what I'm saying? You got to take steps. Like, I knew I wasn't going to go straight to the league and sign 50 million. That wasn't realistic for me. So, you know, I had to set different goals. And, you know, the business stuff came to me. It was just like, I know basketball is cool, but, you know, let me go get this money from them and flip it. You know what I'm saying? And once I actually learned how to flip money, and it wasn't like, okay, I'm going to put all my money into one basket and try to double it. Like, once I actually learned how to really play around with money, then it started clicking. It was like, all right, I got these ideas. Like, now I got some money. Like, now, like, I can start to do some of the things that I wanted to do, but also be safe. Like, you know what I'm saying? My biggest fear is to go broke. Like, I always tell people, like, they ask, like, what's your fear? Like, my biggest fear is to, like, I never want to go broke. So anything I do and, you know, people hit me up, they're like, oh, I see you, you drive this or you, your house is this. I'm like, but I protect myself. Like, it's, any purchase I make, I'm already protected. So, once I started getting into businesses, like when I went into college, I was always in real estate. I knew that was one of the safest investments. So I was a RPM major. Um, and I started learning about that and I eventually changed it to consumer studies because of the business side of it. I wanted to combine everything. And so that as soon as I got overseas, it was like I was telling my advisors, like, yo, I need to do this. I need to do this. They like, nah, you need to save money. Like I already had the ideas, but. So then I'm like, okay, well, what can I do to get the money that I need to get into, you know, the stuff I really want to get into? And it was like, all right, my agent was like, you need to be one of the top players in Europe. Like now we looking at the NBA. Now you can go buy, you know, whatever you want to buy and, and you're good. You won't have to worry about the money side of it. And that's kind of what set the tone for me. Like it motivated me my first five years overseas because like I ain't had no girlfriend. Like this, this is the first year I had a girlfriend overseas. This this is my 11th year as a professional. Like I didn't, I wasn't even interested in a girlfriend. Like I was interested in like getting my family out the hood, like going to buy that 650, like you know what I'm saying, making sure all that stuff was straight. So once I decided to get into business, to get into a relationship, that part was already out the way. So now, you know, looking back, I just took steps, and I tell everybody like I take steps with the business side. It's like now, you know, I'm 11 year pro, so people see all my stuff stacking up. It didn't just happen overnight. Like it, it happened over the a course of 11 years. And, you know, I just took steps to put myself in that position, but I always had that mentality of, you know, trying to hustle, trying to flip money. Uh, but it's just like, people think flip money is just like go all in and then try to make double or lose it. Like, nah, I knew, I knew how to flip money 
and also be safe. And, you know, that's just kind of been my blueprint for everything. And it's kind of helped me out and worked for me. Man, that's super dope. That's super dope that uh, that you're able to reflect on that. And uh, I think it's good for people to hear, especially, you know, young players, uh, young hoopers that are aspiring to play NBA overseas, wherever, um, that you that you were able to focus on the process and, you know, you played at every level. Um, so I think, you know, it's easy to say that, but I think that kind of gets lost. Um, that kind of gets lost in, in translation, for lack of a better term. Uh, because, you know, you get to April and a lot of these seasons and it's like, man, you're exhausted. You want to stop getting up shots. You don't want to, you really, you just, especially overseas, you know, you really just want to go home because going home is kind of like Christmas for us. You know what I mean? So, I mean, you know, I saw Adrian Banks had posted something about, you know, it's April 1st, but don't lose, don't lose focus. You know, don't lose sight of what's going on because you're going to really just going to throw away everything you work for, which really just kind of resonated <laughs> with me. Um so, you know, I actually had a teammate, too. I had a teammate in my first year in, in Italy. And, uh, you know, we were down 3-2 in Cantu on the road. Uh, and uh, semifinals, I think, you know, a seven-game series in Europe. And, you know, he was – we all ready to go home. Not just him. We all ready to go home. It's the middle of June. Um, and we down 3-2. But he's emailing his people like, oh, I'm going to be home on Tuesday, yada, yada, yada. I have to get home. <laughs> And, uh, you know, do and then we ended up, we was down by like, I think That's one or 10 seconds man. left. Like, Somebody hit a shot, put us up by one. We ended up winning the series and going to the finals. We there a whole nother week, but it was just, I just remember my first year just being exhausted and from that grind and all that. And that but that particular story always stuck with me because I ain't never seen no shit like that. But yeah, it's definitely important to, to stay locked yo, in. Yo, <laughs> what's the uh, what's the earliest y'all ever packed y'all bags to go home in the season? Mm. I think uh, probably I always kind of played. I always was in the, like a final situation, so it was kind of it was kind of harder for me. But uh, I think when I was in Munich, uh, I think when I was in Munich, that, it was crazy. I was sending this when I first started sending boxes home. I wasn't trying to travel with my bags, and it wasn't even like I wasn't even really technically checking out. I really was just trying to like I had so much stuff there. I was trying to get it home, so it was like. I think we was uh we had we, we got eliminated in Euro League. So it had to be around like late April. Like we had just started playoffs in, in Germany and I was bringing these big ass boxes to the to the office to send home and they was looking at me like like bro like like what you doing? Like then they called me in the office like after the after the first round we had we lost like we won a game and lost a game in Oldenburg and I brought a box in and they thought I was like checking out i'm like nah bro like i'm just trying to send all these shoes home because we couldn't wear nikes so i was getting all the nikes and all the jordans but my apartment was just full of stuff so i was just sending stuff home and it just so happened we lost the game mm -hmm. and they thought i was checking out i'm like nah bro like like yeah i mean i mentally i'm, I'm kind of there but now nah, i'm trying to win this championship but yeah i never really packed up early and especially now uh, I, I like to send stuff home so like i was like next week i'll probably send home all my winter stuff so it's a little different how I operate now, but when I my first couple of years, I was ready to go. Like it was, mm -hmm. them bags packed. Once once them playoffs came around, bags packed. Man, my rookie <laughs> year, I had my bags packed in February. I was so ready to go home. <laughs> we went to the finals. We were there. We was there. We were there until late June, and I had my bags packed in February. Yeah, after that first break, you get that first break. That New Year, <laughs> yeah, it's over with. It's, it's all downhill. And when we played, when I played in uh, Buda Velnik, we won, I think we won the finals, bro. We won in Ukraine, uh, in Kiev. Uh, the owner had a party for us at the club. I forgot what the club was, the big club in, in Kiev. So we all had tables. We went there. My shit was already in the car. Like, you know, we supposed to wait like three days, like to leave. So I called, like, I called, the, I called my driver. I said, bro, like, after the game, go get my like I'm gonna go get my bags and then we leaving straight from the club. So we in there, like everybody drunk, they talking about like next year, they like, yo, what is it gonna take to bring you back? So whatever, everybody on the dance floor, they like, yo, come to the dance floor. And me and Leo Lyons, we had six AM flights. So it's like, bro, it's like two thirty, three AM. I look at him, I said, Bro, like I'm about to fake like I'm going to the dance floor. I'm out of here. He like, bet. Bro, I, that's the last time I talked to anybody on the team. Like I ain't <laughs> Right, like we just won the championship, bro. I was like, man, I'm out of here, bro. We, like we went straight to the airport, bro. 
And like that was the funniest shit ever, bro. Like, cause it was like you know with those like level clubs, they didn't really care. But it was like everybody was drunk. They was talking about extensions. It's like, man, I'm trying to go home, bro. We just won a championship. I'm on my flight is six a.m., bro. Like they, I'm not staying here three days. Get out of there. Never talked. They ain't even hit me. They sent my money. Ain't never. We ain't even never talk about nothing else. Like that was it. Hey, that's that's one flight. That's one flight. Ain't no, <laughs> you get there hella early. Yeah. <laughs> Be there three hours early. Man. <laughs> Passport taped to your chest. <laughs> like I'm ready to go. <laughs> Man. I was out of there, bro. <laughs> but uh, you know, we're gonna segue into our next segment, which Ant gonna lead us with is a paycheck rain check. So Ant, yeah, take it away. Paycheck rain check, man. We just basically talk about situations where you know somebody or multiple people's paycheck maybe maybe taking a rain check because of uh some type of financial situation but uh man this is more of just like a learning lesson man this week man uh you know i kind of want to bring light to uh kevin pangos situation you know having uh having left cleveland and you know signing with cheska before the war happened and obviously you never can account for war happening or anything like that but i think you know now obviously he's uh he's back in the states working out but i think that uh you know, the lesson, you know, that I think a lot of players need to take into account, you know, when they're taking jobs overseas, and I'm not speaking about Kevin in, in particular, I'm just saying in general, uh, you really got to pay attention to these political situations, man. You know what I'm saying? And even uh, even like back when, when France started uh, started raising the taxes and whatnot, when they started taking, you know, money out of cash check. And I remember talking to DeMarcus Nelson after he done won the championship and, uh you know, and he told me about, you know, the amount of money they took out of his, his bonus and all that other stuff. Like, um, you mm, know, it's, it's real important for, for players to kind of pay attention to political situations around, you know, the country that you're going to, um, you know, prior to signing places, man. Because you, you just never want to, especially if you're, you're leaving a situation um, or you have multiple options, you never want to get into a bad situation, man. Yeah, for I mean, for me... Uh like, I, I mean, that's that's part of my business side. Like, I never, that's the one thing, uh, the most important thing for me, I never was going to go into a situation where the money was, was, was fucked up. Um, and that's something I stood on. Every team that I played for, everybody I talked to, the first, one of the first questions I asked anybody who called me with interest was, you know, about the money. And, you know, most people, like, uh, most people would lie about it. But we always did homework. My agent always put me on the phone. And this was, this, you know, having a good agent helped this too. Uh, he always put me on the phone with somebody who played there, you know, that year before me or, or in the two years before. And I always was able to ask questions about the money. So um, that's one thing. I'm, I'm zero tolerance with, with money. Like, is if I come over here, I leave everything behind, I, I need to get paid. I don't care if I'm playing my worst or whatever. Like, you know what I'm saying? If I'm doing my job, I need to be compensated on time. Like that's that's something I didn't play around with. And you know, Ukraine was pretty much one of the only places that tried it, but I got the whole team paid. Like I, I told everybody, they they said something about the money, they would send a fake receipt, and I was like, I'm not playing if y'all don't give me my money. And then everybody in the team was laughing. I was like, I'm not coming to practice tomorrow. And they was like, All right, whatever. I ain't coming to practice the next day and now everybody took me serious. And they had a team meeting and then everybody decided not to practice and we got like everybody got paid so it was like you got to learn like for me it's never i don't care if a team would have said something bad about me on the business side because i did my job like if i come there you don't have problems with me off the court you can't say no, i never got in trouble you can't say i did anything negative i'm always been a leader on the team but i demand my pay and that's a problem i never cared about that so that's one of the things I always stood on. And like you said, players got to definitely pay attention to it because I talk to a lot of players and they ask me and I'll tell them like, yo, they're not going to pay you. And they think like, okay, well, I might, maybe I'm not the one that's, that's not going to get paid. Maybe they'll, they'll pay me. Like, and then four or five months later, they just play four or five months and they don't get paid. And now they complaining and they writing on Instagram about how teams not paying them, but we've already told you that they're not going to pay you. So it's like, uh, players got to be smarter about it because this is a business. Like I understand, like some people don't have, you know, the, the, the proper opportunities. They don't have the best financial situations. But it's not going to help your financial situation if you leave and come over here and don't get paid. And if you do decide to leave that team, they still might try to blackball you. Like it's it's a lose lose. So 
Uh, that's that's one thing I never, you know, I never really cared for because I, I never tolerated it. But anybody who ever hits me up and uh, players will tell you now, even if they're not with my agency, even if we're not even close, like people hit me up for advice, I'll call my agent or I'll get on the phone with, you know, Elpa or somebody and I'll get the information for them and send it to them. And that's just because, like, that's the type of person I am. Like, I, I know why we come over here. So regardless if you in my circle or not, I'm going to try to give you the best possible advice, you know, for your situation. And, you know, that's doing my part. I feel like that's that's all I could do, you know, to help uh, the players behind me out. At this point, you know, you're a legend overseas, man. I mean, like we said, all your league first team, uh, been in the, been in your league five years. So uh, given the heights that you've reached and the success you've had as an American, which is, which is unbelievable, uh, what are like the top three things or some things that you could uh, give advice to to younger players when it comes to choosing a team or a situation? I mean, I, I think it's two different perspectives. So I think when you first come to Europe, it's about your opportunity to play. Uh, it's not so much about the money, but definitely stability financially, not the amount of money and just being able to live comfortable. Um, <clears throat> I think those are the top three. I think as you know, I got older throughout my career. Uh, where I was playing at was the top. Like, that was the most important. Being able to live somewhere comfortable, being in a good city, I think that was the top. Then it was, you know, the money. And then it was just about the people uh, around me. Like, you know, I didn't really care about, like, when I went to local, it wasn't about, I could have played for some of the bigger name teams before, but I actually liked our team in local better than, you know, some of the other teams that was the big name teams and we was beating them. So, uh, I think the opportunity overall, I would say opportunity is first, you know, you know, living situations and the money, uh, if, if you want to break it down into the three. But I think, you know, being able to play like being able to have fun hooping takes care of a lot of other stuff. So the city could be not as good. But if the basketball is great, you know, you get to travel around and you having fun hooping. It kind of makes it a little bit better. But you could be in a good city and, and y'all suck and it's going to just turn into trying to figure out what you're doing after the game. Like, it's, you know, it's, it's hit or miss with that. But I think the basketball is the most important thing, though. Man, you done played at, at the highest levels of every level of basketball. You know, I think you led the ACC in scoring, uh, played the highest levels of Europe, played in the NBA. So that being said, obviously, you didn't see a lot of different styles of basketball over the, year, which I, over the years, which I think is a, was really dope. I don't think a lot of people get to see that. Um, so uh, having that acumen, you know, there's four guys, four international players at the top of the MVP race. Who best fits in the NBA and who best fits the FIBA style? Uh, I mean, it would have to be it would have to be Luca. I mean, I think um, we seen Luke like Luca was dominant. It's just like his swagger about him was different than most Europeans, and like we kind of seen his game translate to the NBA before he even you know when he was young, 17, 18, where he was doing the Euroleague. You know, people always talk about European guards playing in the league and how good they are, but, like, Luka was a different type of talk. Like, everybody – I think everybody knew that Luka would be good in the league. And, you know, he plays the same exact way. Like, it's crazy. Like, he didn't have to adapt his game at all. He didn't have to speed up. He don't have to be athletic. He's just so skilled that his game just – he has the best game for both worlds. And, you know, when he comes back, he played in the summertime with the national team. He played the exact same way, and he getting 40 – with the national team, people not getting 40 night in, night out on the national team. So, like, he's definitely, I think, the the best balance in between, you know, European and, and NBA. And he's kind of, I mean, he, he's the guy right now. Of course, you know, Jokic um, is one of the most skilled big men. But I think as far as what Luka is doing uh, on both sides is impressive. I think, I don't think he's the best European in the NBA, though. I think, I mean, Giannis is, for me. Gian- Giannis is the best European player in the NBA, yeah. or European player. But yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Giannis. Yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, in regards to playing both in Europe and, and NBA, I, I'd have to agree that that is Luca. I mean, if you look at uh, you know just a lot of the players that are dominating, you know, Euroleague, it tends to be a guard. I mean, it's a guard's game primarily, you know, with bigs. You know, they can double, they can do so many things. But, you know, when you got a guard that can handle the ball, that can shoot, and he's a threat to dime it off, and he keeps the help side a little hesitant, 
You know what I mean? I think uh, I think Luca's the easy choice, and he's and he's shown that he's done it. I mean, he did it at a young. He was a baby. <laughs> you know what I mean? He did it as a baby. You can imagine now, like. <laughs> So uh, yeah, it would be crazy. Yeah, it'd be crazy right <laughs> now. So uh, I think Luca for sure. And I'm gonna try and be different, just for the sake, just for the sake of the argument. Um, I'm gonna go with uh, I'm gonna go with Giannis. Uh, you know, in the NBA, especially right now, Giannis. I think it's you know I've kind of it's been a, taking a minute for me to get to this point, but he kind of he's he's the top dog right now. It's looking like at this point at least. So you know, just his ability to obviously get in the paint and. Just make everybody better. His passing, his shooting, all the skills he's developed, and I'm in FIBA as well. You know, I think his uh, ability he can kind of he can defend the paint like Gobert in FIBA, uh, but then at the same time his offensive versatility, like I said, is growing. So I like to see him get another crack in the in the FIBA games. You know, I think he struggled a little bit, or at least struggled for his for his uh, standards. You know, he probably was still I don't know what he was averaging, probably still twenty and fifteen or whatever it was, but you know, just didn't look as great. So I think with his uh, the way his game is going, I like to see him in FIBA again, and uh, I think I think he'll be top dog out there too. Yeah, because he I mean Giannis definitely he developed his shot a lot. Uh, he's definitely more confident. It's just you know he, I've seen Luca do like I've seen Luca do it already. So like with Giannis, like I I think Giannis right now is the, the, the top player in the league, and you know KD is the most skilled, the best scorer, but it's like. Giannis's mentality is is different. Like he really don't care, or he's not scared. He don't back down from nobody, and he don't lose matchup. He never loses his matchup ever. So it's like for a player like that, I think an NBA side like is that's my guy. I want to see him do that. And you know the Greek national team, they're starting to try to you know get their team back to where it was. So you know Slovenia has been a, a great national team. So Luca has has that advantage as well. Like, they've had a good team. He's had a, a good supporting cast. But I, I definitely want to see what Giannis do when they, when they pack in the paint. You got Gobert and them, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, when you when you have to shoot, like, an NBA is more space, so you got time. You ain't got that time and, and FIBA. <laughs> you got to you gotta figure it out. But it, it's going to be interesting. Yeah, this know, summer going to be interesting. Five, man, he can just park that. it in the paint and just wait for you at the rim. You know what I mean? It's, uh, it's definitely different with the uh, international rules. Yeah, I'm thinking you could put Giannis at the five and probably draw him away from the rim, or draw, draw Gobert away from the rim, and Absolutely. cast like that and just make them real versatile. But give me a finals matchup and the most intriguing playoff matchups that you think we'll see. Uh, I, I want to. I want. I think. I mean, I I love Kyrie and KD. I want. I want to see them two in the finals. But I'm. I'm gonna go Phoenix. I'm gonna go Phoenix and Milwaukee. That's 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 my finals prediction. I think I want I want CP to get one, but Giannis is Giannis different, man. Like I, I I want I want CP to get one, but I, I'm gonna go. If I had to pick, I'm gonna go Milwaukee. I just think they prepare like they just they prepare for it. Like they yeah, they ready for it. Phoenix is definitely coming out of the West. Um, you know, I, I just. Granted, I think I think Milwaukee's a better team than Brooklyn, but you know I, I think teams they're able to keep the games close, and then that star power kind of takes over, and then you know Kyrie and KD. I mean, you just never know what could happen, man. I mean, they yeah, that's what that's what I want to see though. I think they do have they got everything they need in Brooklyn right now. If they right. don't do it this year, like I mean, they got a bench, they got shooters, and you are gonna have Kyrie back full time, like. That's that's the obvious choice, but I just with what Milwaukee's done over the last three, four. It's kind of like how uh, Toronto was. Like when I was in my two years in Atlanta, Toronto was the best team in the East, and nobody was talking about it. Like it was, it was always Bron, it was always Celtics. Like Toronto was the best team. Like they was the best team two years, and it just like it took them to change one thing to win a championship. And you know what I'm saying? It fell apart after that because everybody did what they did, but. It's kind of the same way. Like, Milwaukee wasn't even, like, when I was in the league, like, Milwaukee wasn't even a content. Like, nobody even talked about Milwaukee. They changed coaches. They brought in a couple of other players. And then from that point on, like, they've been the best. They might not have the best record right now, or I don't know what it is. I haven't followed it. But they, they are definitely the best team and the most equipped to win the championship. But, yeah, with Kyrie and KD, it's, it's fun. It's going to be fun to watch. I know that. But that first round, whoever they catch – it's gonna be a tough first round matchup. 
I, and in uh, Milwaukee, you know, they also got, you know, the world's tallest shooting guard back in uh, Brooke Lopez, you know, my my former teammate, man. my former college teammate. <laughs> it's impre- hey, man, it's, hey, he's impressive, bro. i never seen a five man come off a pin down and shoot threes, man. Hey, like, he's, he's, hey bro, I had a, uh, I had a, I remember like back in 20, this might have been like 2015, 2016, I did a, I did a podcast with a uh, Darren Collison. And we were just talking. He was like, "Bro, like, I've never seen it. I've never seen a five man come off down screens. Like, I'm setting, I'm setting a flare. Like, they're setting flares for a five man." And he's talking about Brooke at the time. And now, since then, he's just made a living off of that. Like, he ain't even got to go down there no more. Yeah, he 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 redefined his career. Like, it, it was no drop off with his career, and he shifted everything he did. Like, he always was skilled and had a touch, mm-hmm. but it's like. To be able to transition from that to like pretty much be a predominantly three point shooter, like that's that's hard to do for a, a guy that big. Nah, straight and up. And he like it was no drop nah, off with like yeah, like it was no drop off with with his career. <laughs> like he's just as important as a strip five as he was when he was one of the most dominant post players. Yo, and like I remember, I went to the uh, USA uh, practices like a couple summers ago, and he was a. Uh, they were doing shooting drills. It was him, Joe Harris, and uh, I forget who the other guy was, man. But it was just weird to me. I'm like, yo, Brooke is really out here, like, shooting with, like, the <laughs> best shooters in the league and winning. You're, like, winning spots, like, easily. I'm like, he's a legit shooter now. It's wild, man. It's wild to see. It's, a, it's the game, man. Game is evolved. Some people hate it. I love it, though. <laughs> man, I'm gonna be different again. I'm rocking. I'm rocking with Philly, man. I think Harden and Embiid get it done. Philly, uh, like you think you know, Philly I think can do it? in the half court side. I think their ability to get to the free throw line is gonna be big for them down, uh, down in the playoffs. You know, I think hopefully, hopefully they can avoid Brooklyn and Milwaukee to the conference finals. That'll obviously got, make it easier. Yeah, they got ducks. And, they got you know, ducks. Harden's got a lot to prove. I think it's kind of like a do or die situation for them, but. You know, I've been I've been a Harden, you know, I've I've been a Harden guy for for a while, so I want to see him get a ring for sure. And I think Embiid been the MVP. So, you know, we'll see what happens, but definitely they gotta avoid Philly or Philly or, or I'm sorry, Milwaukee or Brooklyn until until the Eastern Conference Finals and then we'll see what happens. Man, last question before you go, man. We hear a lot of the negative stuff about being overseas and, you know, a lot of those stereotypes, like we said, being paid late and, you know, it's tough. Obviously, it's not easy, but we want to hear uh, your favorite thing about being overseas or what you love about Europe and this grind the most. Uh, I mean, my, my I think my favorite thing with what I thrived on was the pressure. You know, like, um, I think I, I still tell people, even playing in the NBA, like going in the arena night in, night out, is no pressure, like. A, like a yearly playoff game or walking into like Panthinaikos with, you know, 15,000 or Red Star with 12. Like it's, it's a different type of atmosphere. Like it's, it's, it's hard to describe, but it's like the NBA is sometimes more entertainment. Like European basketball isn't your entertainment at all. It's like you got to be locked in every game. And if you lose, it feel like it's the end of the world. Like people don't really understand like, if you lose a game in Europe, like, and I mean, we play a lot of games, but it's teams who play one game a week. And if you lose that game for the rest of the week, like, you got to think about, you know what I'm saying? Like, the mood of the practices might be bad. So I think me, just uh, that pressure, um, it makes or breaks you. And I think the top guys in Europe kind of thrive on it. Um, I think, you know, if you like playing a team style of basketball, it's definitely a way to to develop your game. Um, like you said, like early in my career, I was a scorer. Like coming out of college, like I had two options. Greenberg told me like first option was to shoot. If you can't shoot it, then maybe, maybe, you know, pass it. So like I was always a playmaker, but I was, it was always the rim first for me. And once I came to Europe my first year and I learned how to like hit the 45 on a pick and roll in the corner, like I never did that in my career. It kind of helped me develop. And I think, uh, you know, playing in Europe slows everything down for you uh, and, and definitely makes you a better player. So I, I definitely appreciate, you know, the years that it has helped develop me. Man, that's, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense, man. But, hey, we appreciate you joining us, man, for sure, taking time out of your, your quest for your EuroLeague championship um, and taking a, taking a couple minutes to sit down with us. It means a lot. That's love. You know, Appreciate y'all, guys. my guys, as and, uh, always. For anybody listening, you know, you can go catch our podcast, the Role Player Podcast on YouTube, obviously. You know, and then you can catch it on EuroHoops.net. 
And then as well, you can catch it on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. So plenty of outlets. Keep showing love. Keep supporting. And we'll see y'all next time.